Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome back to the lecture series in bioenergy. So, in the last class, uh, we finished with the Kelvin cycle and we talked about the energy expenditure and uh, we concluded the class with the fact that the photosynthetic efficiency is 30 percent. We talked about how many ATP molecules are required, how many NADPH are required, how many water molecules and how many carbon dioxide and what is the end product of 6 carbon glucose or starch molecules, okay, starch or sucrose molecule. So, today what we will do is, uh, if you guys remember that at some point I was telling you about the Rubisco and the problems with Rubisco. So, today's lecture will be about C3 and C4 plants. But the way I will move is that first of all, I will give you an idea exactly what is the significance of this. So, actually Rubisco as per the evolutionary chemist or evolutionary biologist, Rubisco possibly evolved in an environment in a distant past at some point which was rich in carbon dioxide. Rubisco as an enzyme was never really made by nature or you know engineered by nature to handle a situation of high oxygen. And as we have already discussed that Rubisco has both ways of binding, it can bind to oxygen, it can bind to carbon dioxide. Okay. So, now it has been observed that at higher temperature if the ambient temperature goes up, say for example, somewhere in the tropics or semi-arid tropics where the temperature during the summer goes to like say 45 degrees centigrade or at least even 42 or you know hover between 45 to 50 degrees centigrade. It has been observed with the increase in temperature, Rubisco's affinity for oxygen increases. What does that mean? That means, Rubisco which was supposed to bind to carbon dioxide and promote carbon dioxide sequestration or carbon capture instead utilizes the oxygen. That means, instead of synthesizing it is now utilizing oxygen. So, there is no evolve, evolving of oxygen instead it is consuming oxygen a process which is also called photorespiration. So, now if you just think, let us do not go to the details first of all, try to get the philosophy of it. If you think that an enzyme which is so critical for the plant to carry out uh, photosynthesis is now involved in consuming oxygen. So, what we have talked about the 30 percent efficiency of photosynthesis is going to go down, because part of the energy will be consumed in the respiration process and that thing whole thing or photorespiration and this that whole thing will continue till the temperature comes down. But then how in all these semi-arid tropics and tropical areas or the places on the earth where there is huge amount of incoming solar radiation, how the plants grow? There are several crops which grows. Okay. Interestingly, many of those plants, many of those crop plants have developed or devised a very interesting technique to compensate for it how they do so. So, before we get into the detail of what are this, those mechanisms and everything, let us uh, talk about little bit about the anatomy of the leaf. So, if you see a leaf, suppose this is a leaf okay, which is growing. So, on top surface, if you take a microscope and you take a section of the leaf, you will see there are very small structure called stomatas. Okay. So, it, it looks something like this. It's coming back to the slide. If you see a structure of the leaf, something like this. Okay. So, 
if you take a cross section of it. So, if I take a cross section like this. So, in the cross section what will you see? There are cells like this. These are the plant cells with the cell wall like this. And in between, so these are all the plant cells what I am drawing. You will see certain structures like this. Okay, something like this. These are essentially the one which I drew in red color. These are essentially called the stomata. So okay. these are called stomata. So a stomata are small pores which regulates exchange of gases and regulate movement of water, regulate, I am just showing movement of water, I am just showing by arrow the movement. Okay. So now, if this structure regulates the movement of water, so at a high temperature, these stomatal pores closes because it cannot afford to lose water. Now think of a situation, if the stomatal pore closes at a higher temperature, automatically gaseous exchange is kind of now prevented, because I told you that a stomata has two functions. One function is that it allows the gas to slide in and slide out, glass molecule diffuses through the stomata and the water molecules moves out in the form of vapor and some of the water molecules will come inside through that. Okay. Now at a high temperature, what is happening is this, the stomatal pore is shut down. So, automatically carbon dioxide which is supposed for the plant it is supposed to you know trap the carbon dioxide does not happen. So, now correlate the two situation. First, let me put it together. The first point what I mentioned to you was the Rubisco in the first in the beginning. So, Rubisco become more oxygen binding okay, when the temperature is higher, right? Point 1. Point 2, when the temperature is higher, the stomata closes okay. and if the stomata closes, so automatically there will be fall in CO2 intake. So, essentially these two situations where the CO2 intake is reduced and the stomata is closed and the Rubisco, this essentially promotes in a way something like this, where the Rubisco is binding to oxygen. Now, what is the strategy the plant kingdom developed in order to ensure that Rubisco functions? So, one strategy could be if some way or other, some way or other in that local vicinity just underneath the stomatal pore, if some way or other they could trap a lot of carbon dioxide. So, it means you have a store of carbon dioxide which you are holding out there. Okay? And if you could trap those carbon dioxide and transform them, obviously just think of it, you cannot trap carbon dioxide because there is no cylinder there. Okay? There is no, so, you have to transform carbon dioxide into some other form there. If you have a mechanism by virtue of which say for example, CO2, it transform into a product X and then that X product you have some way or other again make it CO2. Understand? Something a strategy like this. So, there is lot of ambient CO2. Okay. So, this CO2 is being picked up. Suppose this is the plant cell it is taking up the CO2 and concentrating it at one point and this CO2 it is converting into an X compound which by another process could again release CO2, okay? something like this. So, in other word, this vessel what I have drawn here is acting as a kind of a, a reservoir 
to trap CO2 and the idea is to maintain a high CO2 level such that the rubisco is more affinity has more affinity for CO2. Okay? So, this is the strategy then how the plant does it. Here comes the catch. So, say for example, if this is the leaf and so we are taking the cross section. So, if you see the cross section, it has an upper layer and it has a lower layer. Okay. So, now the upper and the lower layer is filled with a cell called the epidermis, okay? something like this. These are called the epidermal layers, upper epidermis which is the top of the plant okay? and this is the, so this is up epidermis upper or upper epidermis and you have the lower epidermis. Okay? And in the center of it, you have the xylem phloem vessels which are rolling through. Okay. So, this is the xylem phloem X and P that is essentially for xylem and phloem vessels. Around that, now I will show in light green are a series of cell where most of the Kelvin cycle is happening. Okay. Those are called, there is a name for, called bundle sheath cells. Okay. And between the bundle sheath cell and the epidermis, and by the way, on the epidermis layer, you are having those stomatas and all those things which are sitting out there, which is in direct contact with the air. Underneath this, now I will put a blue color or there are cells which are arranged something like this. These are called the mesophyll cells or mesophyll cells. Okay? So, the cross section if you look at it, so you have the upper layer, upper epidermis, underneath you on the, on the epidermis you are having these stomata underneath you are having the mesophyll cells, a lining of mesophyll cells, underneath you are have the vas vascular sheath layer and then underneath you are having the xylem flame. Again that repeats further in the same pattern. Okay. Now, coming back to the slide, so the catch lies out here in this layer, this layer what you see, I am just putting it, the one which I am dotting now in the mesophyll layer. So, there are two categories of plants. I will explain it why they are called. One is called C3 plants, the other one is called C4 plants. And in a C3 and C4 plant, the different lies in that mesophyll layer. These mesophyll layers are very intensely packed in C4 plants like this. Okay? Almost like as if like a cylinder, they are standing out there. So, this is how they are packed. So, instead of these blue, you have to replace it by a something and they are in very, very close proximity with on the epidermal layer, the stomata like this, okay? something like this and some of them even are in direct contact with the air and you are having the epidermal lining like this, which is I am putting in a light green color. Okay? Whereas, on the contrary, these mesophyll lining is something like this, crinkled shape like this and underneath you are having the stomata like something like this. Once again, okay, the stomata is like this. Okay. So, now what happens? The specialization lies in this layer of the mesophyll cells. These mesophyll cells, what they do, either they are direct contact with the air or through the stomata, 
this is that reservoir what just coming back to the slide these mesophyll cells for the C4 plant is this reservoir like this that CO2 reservoir. So, what is happening inside these mesophyll cells because it is underneath the mesophyll cells you are having the layer of bundle sheet cells which are sitting here. So, this is where all the, the Kelvin cycle is taking place okay? and coming to the CAM pathway after this. Okay? So, and out here, so this is the reservoir where something is happening and what is happening in that reservoir. So, in that reservoir CO2 is getting accumulated and transformed into certain four carbon molecules called malates. Okay? And there is a series of transformation, let me put it down on the slide that will make more sense. So, what is happening inside this? Now, we are into the C4 plants. In the C4 plants, so let us put the two cell layers. So, this is the mesophyll cell layer out here. I am just drawing it horizontally, there I draw, drew it vertically, now I am drawing it horizontally. And adjacent to it, you are having the bundle sheet layer which is in close touch with it. So, this is the bundle sheet layer, bundle sheet cells where the Kelvin cycle is happening. Okay? So, this is where the Kelvin cycle is happening and this is the bundle sheet. So, this is the bundle sheet cells. Whereas, out here you are having these are the mesophyll cells. Okay? So, in the mesophyll cells they are in direct contact with the air. So, here once again here you are having CO2 coming from outside. So, this is the environment either okay, okay. So, CO2 is entering upon entering the CO2 is converted into something called oxaloacetate. Okay. From oxaloacetate it forms molecule called malate. Okay. And this malate is transferred or transported into the bundle sheet cells, where malate transform into a pyruvate and in that process it releases the carbon dioxide. And this carbon dioxide eventually takes part into the Kelvin cycle, okay? Kelvin cycle. Whereas, this pyruvate which is formed here is brought back, transported back here, I am just putting P pyruvate. This pyruvate goes through a very intricate reaction which I am not getting into detail where it is consuming. So, this is where it consuming a lot of ATP molecules and transform it into AMP. So, this is the interesting part is that adenosine triphosphate. So, this has three phosphate groups and AMP it has one phosphate group. So, in other word it is losing two phosphate in that process okay? PI plus PI. Okay? So, it goes through two transition and it form phosphoenol pyruvate PEP phosphoenol pyruvate okay? and this phosphoenol pyruvate again transform into oxaloacetate and again this whole reaction continues. Now, interestingly the first clue of the existence of such cycle or something different was given by a Russian scientist. Okay? Followed by that there this was further. So, coming back to the slide this was further this back in 1960 this idea was thrown that there is something different is happening. After that two scientists explored this pathway which is called or rather discovered this pathway. One of them is M D Hatch and the other one is C R Slack and that is what is this also called Hatch Slack pathway. What they said is that Kelvin side the first clue of the existence of CO2 transport mechanism came from studies showing that the radioactivity from a pulse 14 CO2 you guys remember what we have talked in the beginning 
14 CO2 appeared initially in oxaloacetate and malate and other 4 carbon. So, what you see here, people see here, this is oxaloacetate, malate, these are all 4 carbon chains. Okay. And you remember in the previous situation, we talked about 3 carbons which were starting the process. So, what you are getting a starting point here is the 4 carbon. Okay. So, comparison here is that oxaloacetate versus phosphoglycerate. This is where C3 and oxaloacetate being C4 to the starting point, these are called C4 plants. Okay. And there is a decarboxylation of the C4 compound in the bundle sheet cell maintains the high concentration of basically of the CO2 at the site of Kelvin cycle. And the C3 compound return to the mesophyll cell for another round of carboxylation. So, this whole thing continues. And the enzymes which are involved in this process, one of them is uh, called phosphonol pyruvate carboxylase. Phosphoenol pyruvate carboxylase. And there are a few other which are not really significant at this point, but what is important for you people to understand is what is exactly happening here. The reaction is something like this. Now, I am just putting down the reaction. So, you have CO2 in mesophyll cells okay, plus ATP, you remember that I told you that there will be consumption of ATP plus water which is making it CO2 in bundle sheet cells and plus AMP. I told you ATP gives away 2 phosphate and become AMP, 2 PI because those 2 phosphates are being lost and a proton and 2 high energy phosphate bonds are consumed in transporting CO2 to the chloroplast of the bundle sheet cells. Okay. Now, what we will do after talking about this basic pathway of C4 cells, let us talk about the what is the total consumption of energy in this whole process. So, now 6 CO2, now this is that comparison plus 30 ATP. Now, here you see the difference it is 30 ATP as compared to where you are using, if you talk about the C3 pathway, you are using 18 ATP. So, you are needing more energy for C3. Okay? So, for C3, you need less energy, whereas here you need more energy. Now, coming back, next 12 NADPH plus 12 H2O giving away C6 H12O6 plus 30 ADP because you know phosphates are being lost plus 30 PI that is phosphate 12 NADP plus plus 18 proton moieties which are coming out of it. So, in other word, to put it summarize this whole thing, what does that this means? The tropical plants with C4 pathway do little for photorespiration because it has a high concentration of CO2 in the bundle sheet cells and accelerate the carboxylase reaction relative to the oxygenase reaction. So, this is the challenge carboxylase and oxygenase reaction of Rubisco. So, by this process you are increasing the carboxylase reaction because you are trapping more CO2 making this environment. In spite of having high temperature, you are making this environment more a local concentration of CO2 is much more higher. So, there are plants like sugarcane, most common plant which follows a C4 pathway and I request you to look for 
what are the other C4 plants. So one of the objectives of a lot of bioenergy research directed towards plant genetic engineering is that if we could have more and more plants with C4 pathways, think of it philosophically, what does that, that means we will be sequestering more carbon dioxide because they have a mechanism of kind of a cylinder where they can trap it. There are a lot of efforts happening across the world how the plant could have more CO2, more CO2, more CO2 so that they can transform them into hexose sugar. So this is where all the way from the basic reaction of photosynthesis we reach to the C3 and C4 and this is where we will be concluding the photosynthesis part where how all these different uh, bioenergy resources are being produced. So what we see now, this is the driving force for producing wide range of sugars driving the whole machinery of the plant and which having the enzyme lot of proteins and lipids and all sorts of complex sugar, long chain sugar, short chain sugars and likewise series of them cellulosic and non-cellulosic starch and all that stuff. So now since we know pretty much with all this lecture as of now that this is how the biology is producing all over the world whatever vegetation you see which are dependent on light. We are not talking about the hydrothermal vent where there is no light. Light independent system produces its biomass through this whole chain of photosynthesis, photosynthesis using light synthesizing a series of molecules. So next our goal will be in the next class what we will be starting is that how again these could be transformed from here to energy rich fuels. One aspect what we will be dealing with and the second thing how these materials could be utilized for making charge storage or energy harvesting directly, okay, which will be our advanced topics and we will talk about all this. So to conclude this journey of photosynthesis or the most fundamental mechanism by virtue of which the light dependent uh, synthesis of these molecules are happening. We started with basic architecture, then we talked about photosystem 1 and photosystem 2. We talked about water splitting cluster where the part of the reaction CO2 plus H2O making CH2ON which is the carbohydrates plus uh, oxygen. So H2O2O2 which is essentially the water splitting which is happening underneath for system 2 in the manganese cluster is taking care of that. From there that electron which is the infinite source of electron in the form of water is supplying electron to the for system 2 in order to bring it back to its ground state where because of the 4 photon our electron is being ejected out from the chlorophyll molecules. That chlorophyll molecule which is devoid of the electron is brought back to its ground state then the electron hops to photosystem 2, photosystem 1 from photosystem 2, photosystem 1 simultaneously a series of uh, chlorophyll molecules which are devoid of electron because they have ejected out electron is balanced out, they are being brought back to their ground state and that electron which is donated by the photosystem 1 then supplies funnels that electron to NADP to make it NADPH which is a very strong reductant. And then once that how that NADPH takes care of using C3 carbons how the whole glucose moieties are being formed. And now today we concluded that that is not the only one route, there is another route where C4 carbons are being there. So in other words, there are nano cylinders in the form of mesophyll cells in the plant which has this ability to you know trap carbon dioxide and transform them into four carbon molecules which could release again carbon dioxide and which are being 
funneled into the Kelvin cycle. So, this is the whole summary of photosynthesis including what I just forget to mention in this whole thing all the redox potential and how the electrons are hopping through. So, again please go through. So, this was quite an intensive uh, photosynthesis part what we covered. So, next will be all the processing of all these plant product which are formed now in the form of sugars, proteins and lipids and what all, all the technologies. So, next class see you back in the next class with the phase 2 of it where we will be doing all the processing of generating energy rich fuels and some of the very interesting energy harvesting as well as energy storage products made from biological sources. Thank you.